think uh, this is our fourth, or is this our fifth? Continuation, fourth continuation of the 40B uh, hearing on the Lakeview Eden um, proposal on the uh, housing for both con condominium and for apartments. Um, I won't read through the whole paragraph again, but to say that uh, we are in continuation from our um, September meeting. Uh, continuing on, we got a lot, received a lot of inf information um, over the last month and a half. Um, we're going to try to get through some of it, or a good portion of it, this evening. Um, I'll first start off by asking um, Andrew if you'll recap what we did back in September. October. I'm sorry, October. Um, so October, we had Matt Versailles of Niche Engineering here and um, mm. gave some great comments back on the engineering aspects of the proposal. Um, and since then, the applicants have been working to resolve those comments. Um, along the way, we've gotten a few updates from public safety, including police and fire, the town engineer, um, and we've also finalized the scope um, for what we would like to do with the Walker's Brook Drive area and then some. Um, so a lot of info to get to tonight, but it should be good. Okay. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is first start off with uh, what they've submitted to the to the board that and move forward on that first and use that as a, a basis for where we're going. I'm not sure that all of the things that you have addressed, Ted, are, are going to be finalized this evening, um, but at least we can get started on that. Uh, we are working against the clock. We have basically the date, the dates in January secured um, each and every Wednesday if everybody can make it, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, we truly want to finish this so that we can meet our deadline. I think it's the 23rd of February. I believe that's true. 2019. So why don't we start off with uh, hand it over to you, Ted, and your team to uh, go through the revisions that you have uh, put forward to us. I, I think what I would like. To do, I think what I would like to do, Mr. Chairman, uh, is turn it over to Chris so that he can update you on the plans, and perhaps after that we can hear from peer review engineer and any response. Uh, I think that, sh that should be our major uh, presentation uh, for tonight. And I know uh, Oriana would like to make a presentation uh, uh, at some point. We'll see how that works out. Okay, Chris. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the record. Uh, Chris Sporadis, the civil engineer on the project uh, from the engineering office of Williams and Sporadis, just uh, not too far away in Middleton. And uh, we're here, uh, this is a public hearing number seven. Uh, just to refresh everyone's memory, we started our public hearings back on March 7th of this year, so uh, it's been at it for quite a while. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, uh, we last got together on October 24th. That's when we reviewed the initial engineering report uh, from Niche. And uh, since that time, uh, we've been busy addressing uh, the comments that I'm going to go through. Uh, we just received today a, a follow-up letter uh, from Niche Engineering. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause uh, at each one of the items uh, that I'll say that still has a question. Uh, there aren't that many. Um, and at that point, uh, when there is a, still a remaining question, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Broussard uh, to get up and explain what that question is, and hopefully we can streamline this thing and, and move right along. Uh, since we last met with the ZBA, uh, uh, we filed our notice of intent with the Conservation Commission. That was back on November 14th. And we have a hearing, a public hearing scheduled uh, with the Conservation Commission on December 19th, which is uh, one week from tonight. We, um, as I mentioned, uh, we have been working uh, after that October 24th meeting on responses to the uh, engineering comments, and we submitted revised plans on December 3rd, uh, which brings us um, to uh, tonight's meeting. Uh, there were also a couple of additional memos that were uh, that made their way over to our office. 
with us uh, today, a memo from the police and fire department, which I'm sure we'll get to uh, a little bit later. And there was a memo from the engineering department on December 5th. So uh, uh, for the rest of the night, I'm going to be referring, if you want to, does everyone here have a copy of the Mitch report uh, dated December 12th? Mm -hmm. Did I hear no from the audience? Okay, that's okay. I'm going to go through each other, each one of the items. Uh, so up on the screen uh, next to us here. This is our uh, topographic plan, uh, and uh, we have uh, our topographic plan that has the most amount of detail on it. Uh, there are two sheets at 20 scale, uh, one for uh, the apartment side of the project, and then uh, there's another sheet uh, in the plan set, either before or after this one, I can't remember, uh, that shows the, uh, the 12 uh, townhouse style uh, for sale uh, portion of the project. Uh, We'll be uh, re uh, referring to these two plans uh, for most of the comments. The uh, comment letter is uh, broken up into zoning, compliance, parking, and access as the first section. And then it goes on to grading design, utility services, stormwater management, wetlands and floodplain. And that's the last, uh, that's the, that was the last uh, comment section. And then there was an additional section uh, that's new information, a new review, uh, if you will, additional review uh, that was requested by the uh, uh, town departments uh, with regard to uh, a cursory review of our landscape and lighting program for the project. And I'll talk about that at the end. Uh, so starting from the top, uh, zone compliance on the very first page, parking and access. Comment number one. Uh, was a, a question regarding the actual parking spaces uh, that were not designated for construction as part of the project, you may remember. That's the area of quote unquote banked parking. That's up in this part of the project here. Uh, and because those won't necessarily be built right away, it, it technically puts us less than uh, the one and a half uh, uh, parking space per unit ratio. And so uh, we added that waiver uh, uh, as a as a request on our plan, so no further comment on that. Uh, number two had to do uh, with uh, off-street loading. Uh, we went back uh, to our plan and proposed uh, two 12 by 35 spaces uh, for loading. And they're located um, on the uh, portion of the project that's closest uh, to Walker's Burk, so Walker's Burk is along the bottom of the plan here. We proposed uh, two loading spaces in front of each of our dumpsters. And in addition to uh, showing those uh, parking spaces, loading spaces, if you will, we submitted in our responses a couple of uh, documents, uh, one of which is a plan, a written document, that describes the loading zone and the parking regulations for the proposed project. That was, uh, that was prepared by the development team. And that goes into details on uh, how parking and the loading zone will be managed. The loading space, uh, and uh, do I have control, uh, Andrew, of the sheets? I'll yes. put this up. Yeah. Let me just flip over to our layout plan real quick because it does show it a little clearer, a little clearer here. So this, is a, this shows less information. It's uh, primarily parking in the buildings, uh, zoning information, uh, the width of the aisles, if you will. Uh, this is the plan where you find that our, our parking aisles uh, all show as uh, 24 feet in width on both sides of the project. Here are those two loading spaces. These are the long rectangles that you see here and here. And of course, these would only be used uh, during those times when someone was moving in and out of an apartment if they needed uh, to have a moving vehicle. Uh, this would encroach on the 24-foot on uh, driveway path. This is one of the uh, still remaining unresolved questions uh, that was raised uh, uh, by Mitch, and I'll let Matt just uh, talk about a little bit. Hi, I'm Chris uh, from Mitch Engineering. Um, yeah, we'll put the fairly extensive uh, parking and loading uh, management plan that the applicants put together for the project. <clears throat> that kind of controls access to and parking in these, um, these 
two loading areas located on either side of the site. Um, our uh, comment that popped up for us is that, as Chris mentioned, when if a vehicle was accessing these spaces at you know, full length, it would reduce the access aisle width to around 13 feet, roughly. Um, so for uh, practical purposes, day-to-day -day use by passenger vehicles, if there was a truck park there, obviously <clears throat> there'd be an opportunity for people to basically you know, navigate and negotiate that circumstance by taking turns of passing cars through, et cetera. However, um, one of the comments that uh, project requirements that was originally issued by the, the fire department uh, stated that uh, clear access aisles of 24 feet were required throughout the project. So to us, there's a conflict between those two circumstances that we need to identify. So we just flag that out and ask that either the, um, the applicant offer an alternative uh, for the space location or otherwise verify that the fire department would um, potentially approve use of those spaces as they propose, which um, is just mentioned, uh, limited hours and control, control use of those spaces by the building command. That's in a nutshell on site. Uh, so if I could just follow up, and we're, we're doing this a little on the fly because I, we just got the letters from police and fire. Uh, Chief Burns uh, issued a letter dated December 11th, and he speaks to the uh, loading spaces that we show on this plan. Uh, and I'm quoting from the letter, uh, uh, the memo from Chief Burns dated December 11th. The size and placement of the loading zones in the areas indicated on sheet plan 8 of 17 presents an obstacle to emergency access. Additionally, uh, the loading zone and parking regulations indicated in section 1.5 loading zone rules. The loading zones will be used for overflow or visitor parking at the discretion of management. Parking in the proposed loading zone area is indicated has the potential to constrict the roadway. Consistent roadway width must be maintained around the proposed buildings. So those two um, locations are, are not going to are not going to work. Um, with, uh, you know, uh, because it's not it's not sufficient uh, for the fire department. Uh, so we uh, we have very limited space, obviously, uh, available because of uh, our site constraints. Uh, one of the things, um, an idea that uh, that we have uh, that we come up with to provide at least one space. Uh, and this is again uh, kind of late today, uh, but if I can show you on the plan on uh, on the side of the site here, we have our proposed dumpster location. One of the uh, two locations. There's a second one on the other side. There's a relatively flat uh, area here uh, where we have no retaining walls. We're just about at grade. And uh, one of the things we figured out that we could do uh, is that we, these two dumpsters could be slid over and placed right here. And this loading space could then be slid down all the way back here. And that would, that would allow us to maintain 24 feet of, um, of uh, aisle width there. And we would at least be able to get one uh, loading space. Uh, we, we quickly came up with that this afternoon. Uh, it is not possible to do the same thing on the other side uh, because right at this location here uh, is the, the discharge from one of our stormwater management areas. Uh, and so there's not enough room uh, uh, to make up for that on this side. So that's where we stand on the loading space. Uh, at this point, uh, I can continue uh, with the letter, uh, Mr. Chair, and we can come back to it if the board has any questions or we can ask questions as we go along. I would like to see if we can uh, ask some questions or the board ask questions as you go along. That'll help us get an idea of, of where the board stands and and you coming back to maybe uh, solving some of these difficulties. Um, <coughs> board members, uh, anything thus far for uh, Chris? No. This is for parking in the, the yes. loving space. Right. Parking and loading. Okay. Uh, question I have, Kurt. Uh, <coughs> I read in uh, your your uh, program there you had a plan for uh, loading zones. Correct me if I'm wrong the way I read it, but it seemed to me that you were talking about reserving some parking spaces uh, and blocking those off for loading as, on an as-need basis and. When that was done, that had to be reserved through the uh, management uh, team of the buildings. 
uh, is that still a possibility or is that not uh, to happen? So I'm going to invite Diane and get, and get the arrow uh, from our project team just to come up. I'm probably pushing your name off your I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Guy helped us uh, prepare uh, the parking lot because they, they manage other properties and have, and have experience of doing this kind of thing. So, so cool. Okay. So there's. Identify yourself, Guy. Sure. So, Guy Tano, Manny Malvo, I'm one of the developers of this project. So, there's a, there's a couple of schools of thought here on how we can address this effectively. So, the, the, the first school of thought would be to do as Chris said, and it's a simple solution where we can have a loading zone by sliding those dumpsters over and allowing ourselves a 35 feet down without impeding the, the path, the safe passage rate. The other one, which you, you referred to, uh, was. was the, uh, the other one referred to was was taking some some quantity of spots that would net us out to and I think four would be the requirement maybe five but would net us out to having the ability to park a truck in the space um, and we can, we can block those off as nightly parking only so that they had to um, you know uh, remove themselves from that spot at a certain time in the morning. And, and that way we could use the parking at night when people needed it, and most likely when people there the day. So knowing that if you park in this spot, your car must be moved by X time in the morning, and I think we communicated the time slot in there. So that was the other school of thought. If need be, we could have, and we could do both, right? We could have some, in case there was an overflow of moving vehicles, we could have both there. So those, those were kind of the school of thought. And then the other one was there's this, this, uh, this bank over here, curb cut, I mean, we could always move this spot down a few and have a truck ability to back into this right here and have a loading zone kind of naturally from the curb. Um, and I know there was some issue with that with the, the safety to the sidewalk levels or something like that. Yeah, yeah. 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 those are the ideas. Okay. Right, that, that, second, uh, that second idea was, uh, was providing for a loading space right in this area and removing that landscape island, if you will. But that does uh, potentially pose a problem with vehicles, uh, let's say they pulled in head first, that would, that would mean that somebody might have to back up or back onto, you know, directly onto the right of way. Um, not necessarily what we, what we would want to do. Um, it would make more sense, I think as Guy mentioned, uh, you know, to have a, a routine uh, and the ability to cordon off a couple of spaces that uh, shouldn't need to rise. So those, those are the ideas of behind what's in the, what's in the report. Matt, what do you think? Uh, something that uh, such as this could work? Is it okay if I just do I need to use the microphone? Okay. I, I don't <laughs> see what people um, use. Yeah, certainly could if they could if they could make that program work. With, with, in terms of the development, it would be up to the to the board to determine whether or not we thought that would satisfy the requirement for provision of those spaces and and what. Um, uh, you know, what leverage the town would have over the enforcement of that condition for the project. But there's no reason why it couldn't work. I, I, I agree that um, kind of enlarging the space in the front by removal of that island would not be something that we would recommend for the size of the curb cut that would be required and enter and exit directly onto the public way, which is not typically something that we would recommend. So if that answers your question, it's sufficient. Well, we still have the, the question, Chris. Are you are you specifying that uh, we would reduce it from um, four loading spaces to two, which now is going to be reduced to one? Uh, so we would propose uh, re reducing the, the calculated requirement of four down to two, and have one be a dedicated space over in this area here, and then the second space be the, the floating space that's described in the parking. Um, and that would be uh, that would be the way the way the proposed waiver would be would be written to describe the two loading spaces uh, uh, and, uh, and request the waiver. Where would the where would the floating space be on the same side of the building? So because we would have a dedicated space on one side, I would propose to have the floating space be on the opposite side. I was going to suggest, yeah. You know, uh, right right down this area here, we would. To hatch uh, a, a certain number of spaces and identify it as the as the floating loading space. 
I just made that up. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, the other question is, unless the board has other questions, um, was on the parking. Um, I know that uh, you were using some very creative means of counting spaces, uh, including um, access spaces in with your regular spaces, so that handicap is, as I understood it, to be separated from the regular spaces. <coughs> Um, since they're not assigned, per se. Um, and then you, then you talked about uh, perhaps using the combination of the two sites to get your total number of spaces to 1.5. Oh, lot A and Lot B. Right, let me, uh, we don't have, uh, let me just refer to my paper plan here. Understood that then. This, this might be the time to get Boreano's um, uh, uh, comments in on the park. I'll, I'll take uh, community input, and I know that Boreano was going to try to do a slideshow, but I don't think we have the time to do the slideshow. If you want to address that, Boreano. I just wanted to show the date, and that's how not to do a big slideshow, but I just wanted to see the paper because I, I cannot really like speak. See. Well, can you, can you do this in five minutes? I can do it in three minutes. There are three minutes. <laughs> okay. But I want to, hey, Andrew, can, can we get the slides there? It's really quick. There are three tables. Okay. okay. Watch out for the briefcase. Sorry. <clears throat> okay, so. This is just like uh, we are advocating for a pocket park instead of a park, car park. And I want to be very clear, the development team was very willing, was planning to build the required spaces. They wanted to meet the bylaw at 1.5. The neighborhood asked them to actually create some green space and make this development more attractive and more like uh, so it uh, blends better with the neighborhood. OK. so. Here is the table I wanted to show you. Uh, so this is a study from the Metropolitan Area of Dining Council from 2017. So they studied multifamily development 
So this is like in five communities in Reading, right Boston. Then arguably more urbanized than Reading, but just happens that such communities have more multifamily buildings and they needed uh, like the statistics to it. So they started about 80, um, 80 apartment complexes. So as you can see, the requirements are always uh, higher. So this is what the town requires. For example, Melrose requires two spaces per unit. In reality, they have 123, which means they're giving waivers when those apartment complexes are built. But what it was observed, like only one space per unit. So it holds across all five communities that the demand was much lower than what the requirement is and also what was built. So the conclusion was space is not effectively utilized, so the town can do better. And basically, the parking requirements, if they're applied across the whole community uniformly, that's not the best. And often, such requirements can be obsolete. And the reason is because there's a national trend, decreased demand for parking. And that's due to Uber and Lyft and zip cars and so on. Same day deliveries, people now have a healthier lifestyle. They bike, they walk. And so on. So uh, municipalities are recognizing this uh, across the nation. And so what they're doing now, they give the development teams flexibility. So they are allowing them to um, build parking as needed, and they're also allowing them to convert existing parking to some other purpose. Sometimes it's hard, because if you have underground parking, it's hard to use it for anything else. In, development to kind of, if, if it's required, because they recognize times have changed and maybe the requirements do not apply uh, the same way as they applied when they were kind of created. So this is like maybe apartment, that's the apartment complex just next door. So uh, there are 92 units, 152 spaces, so that gives you a 165 ratio. So my neighbors, um, we have volunteers go there at night and count. Because we wanted to understand what is required, like what is the demand in the area. These are two bedroom apartments. So this is like uh, the mix uh, both here I think puts lots of one bedroom. So what we saw, it was like the ratios were like around 1.2. So as people live there in the same area just next door, there is like one third of the parking lot is empty. So I don't know whether it's practical, but there is overflow parking there. <laughs> it's not in Jordan's, it's just next door. I'm not saying that's how we should go about it, but the reality is just next door. They built the parking and it's empty. So we would like to avoid the situation here as much as possible. So we believe people require less parking because they've got amenities. There's like dining shops and so on. There is public and we just wanted to mention that Reading Village and, uh, was approved at 1.25, 1, 1, 1. which is the requirement for uh, 40 hours. And we know this is not downtown, but what we observe is that people do live without uh, uh, at the lower car ratio. Okay. And so this is just a summary of what they're asking for and what we would prefer to see. If you see a 1.25, there are 93 spaces, which gives them like eight spaces to use, maybe for loading, maybe for something else, maybe for mixed use parking and, um, and loading areas. So the development team is proposing the second number, which we do favor, and we think we can get the green area that way. If we go for 111, we just will get these huge parking areas, which we do think will be still empty, like one third, because that's what we've seen. But the development team wisely wants to reserve the right to build up if they need to, which I think is the right choice. They don't need to go back to the town. But we just are asking you to give, a, give this development a chance, just to see. And here, just quickly, some pocket parks, pictures for inspiration. And the last slide, we, we are really, this is a slide from our very first presentation when we came to you, and thank you very much for including us in this process fully. And we wanted a better project for our, and here we are advocating for this. And 
uh, we put lots of time and effort to be constructed, and the development team met us halfway, and they made big changes to the design. They met us halfway on this pocket part. So we're asking the town to, to help us create the upward looking modern development. So thank you. Thank you, boy. Thank you. Uh, I have one question for Matt. Um, right now, we're, we're using 18 uh, spaces on lot A um, for parking. Um, lot A is is the uh, is the con condominium area, and that's going to have its own entity down the road as soon as that that's all put together so whatever is going to happen on that is going to be by itself i don't have a problem with the 18 on that personally however uh, i do have a little bit of a problem on lot b and i would i would prefer that um and you tell me what you think, Matt. I would prefer that we lower the expectation in the total number of parking spaces per unit. Remove the 10 from the area that's buildable to a, um, a bank, you might say, that would be used only when needed. Um, and if the development needs to do that, or if the if the apartment complex needs to do that, they would need to come back to, I would have probably say this board to go through that to justify that. So take a lower number and move it up. Um, if needed in the future, take a lower number uh, initially because we're getting definitely that point. Um, and you talked about bicycles, you talked about all kinds of electric cars. I don't see anything not that I'm suggesting that you do it, but uh, we don't have any uh, stations for electric vehicles to come in and uh, park and get uh, rejuvenated, you might say, over a four-hour period or whatever. But down the road, I mean, as we're developing other sites, uh, some of these things, if you're talking about the future, need to be, con need, need to be considered. But right now, personally, it's just one member of the board, I would like to see the ratio lower to maybe, and I, I haven't actually done the numbers, closer to 1.25, um, and then and come up with that bank off to the side, and I would like to see perhaps the economy spaces, instead of all being 9 by 18, reduce some of them to 8 by 18 for their smaller vehicles. Um, all you're doing is just, you're trying to put in there, and if you're using some of that 8 by 18, and one of your spaces happens to be a removal of the loading zone to the opposite side of the building, and you're going to use three or four of those parking spaces, uh, you might fit that in a little bit better than using a 9 by 18. So I'm just suggesting maybe some other thoughts that you would look at. But uh, again, I'm, I'm not recommending that as a board. I'm only recommending that that as one member of the board. Can you ask him my opinion about that? I mean, I think all those suggestions sound like good progressive suggestions for the development. It's my, it's my personal opinion. Have you worked on with some of, some other issues uh, or other developments where some of that's oh, yeah. been used? Pretty, pretty much everything you just rattled off are factors and alternatives for, for uh, residential multifamily developments for parking. So that's something that you might as a Gen generally speaking, those options are um, identifiable to. Uh, uh, they're parking regulations and zoning regulations that address those actual items. So my, you might have an allowance for um, you know, some percentage of, of you know, compact car spaces on your lot or inclusion of, you know, I think one of the things that in a, in a upcoming comment that we identified from the, from the DRT memo that we reviewed was get provision for um, it's like on-site you know, tax space for uh, Things, things like that, and yeah, that's, that's part of how kind of the regulatory adjustments get made. So, you know, because it's a 40D um, project, the developer would choose to, to you know, offer some kind of combination of elements like that. I would think it would be a good 
question from the county council, but I think you have the ability to, to accept those, right? Absolutely, yeah. So that's something that... Uh, it's not, and then nothing, and nothing you just said is an even unusual aspect of parking. So that would be something that, as a team, you could possibly come up with to come back later to us. I mean, we're still in the process of getting all this stuff done and taking it piecemeal. So this is just one item, but parking is a, is a major issue for any development. So that's just one item down. Yeah. I mean, if the rest of the board is okay with that? Uh, uh, so far, what I've heard tonight, John, both with the parking and with the loading zone, I think are uh, 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 progressive thoughts on it, and, and I think it could certainly work here. I do like the idea of uh, having a space that if needed additional parking could be constructed, but not necessarily have it now, and I think it's a great idea to have it as a parking park. Uh, I, I thought the uh, neighborhood group did a great job in their presentation on that, and I especially like the figures from you know, the surrounding towns were nice, but I like the figures from Lakeview, the next door neighbor, what they were uh, using for their parking over there and, and the way the ratios worked out. So I, I think, uh, in my way of thinking, we, we can be comfortable with a, a reduced number of uh, uh, parking spaces here to, to lower the ratio down to, I think there was that middle of 1.3, 37 or 39, something like that. Yeah, something like that. I think would be fine. Uh, I think, it, you know, it's, it's good thinking, I think. Yeah. So a couple, a couple of things. Uh, the, um, the parking ratio right now on the apartment project is, uh, is 1.4 if you were to exclude the 10 future parking spaces. So we're, we're kind of there right now. We have, as a development team, we, we don't long and hard about how many parking spaces to bank uh, because uh, as I, as I said, uh, uh, Guy's group uh, has done a lot of, uh, have, has other projects that has done, has done some research on, on their own needs for parking. Uh, downtown, obviously, there is the ability for some public parking not too far from the development that was mentioned, the 1.25 development. Uh, the other, another item from Chief Burns' letter uh, talked about uh, making sure that uh, there are no, that there's no on-street parking on Lakeview or Eaton. And uh, yeah, to, the, to the point that uh, he wanted us to maybe consider putting up no parking signs. Uh, so if you're a visitor and you're visiting this project, you don't really have an opportunity you know, uh, to have that read readily accessible public parking spaces. And so I think we're going to need all of our 101 parking spaces uh, uh, to, serve, to serve the site. And if we're already a little bit below the 1.5, uh, I, I don't think the development team wants to drop lower than 1.4. Sure. And I, I agree with that, Chris. Uh, we don't have a problem with the 101 space, which we bring it as Oriana said, 1.38, I believe is correct. Uh, with the 111 that we've shown, including the 10 spaces, it would be at 1.5. The only thing I, I think we need to say from the development point of view, correct me, Guy, if I'm wrong, is that we would want to make sure that the decision gives us the ability to come back to you in the event we find that that uh, you know we need more parking spaces and you know, demonstrate that to you and you can you know that is set forth in one of the conditions and then we could create this park as Gloriana is suggesting but we would have the alternative to come back if the problem is presented so. We don't have a problem with that approach. Correct, Guy, am I speaking correctly? That's yes. Something we can work out with them. No, that's something we can work out with them. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's one uh, item, Chris. Sure, so I'm um, happy to report that most of the comments are no comment, no remaining comments. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we just happened to hit that one, you know, up, up front. It's a safety issue, yeah. you know, the, the chief commented on it, so it's really important that we talk about it. I mean, we only got the letter from the fire department to, this evening. Right. Uh, so looking at that and trying to work that in with the rest of uh, the comments that were put together, uh, I think still you're working with the staff to try to come up with something right. to present back to the board. Uh, so I'm uh, moving on to page two. 
Uh, number three, item right number three, uh, it asked us to uh, install uh, proposed uh, accessible parking signs at the handicap spaces, and we added that to the plan, so no further, no further comment there. The next section is grading design, and grading design had uh, four items, one through four. Uh, the first item uh, had uh, uh, some questions about uh, adding additional detail uh, so that um, someone looking at the plan of building it had more information on, uh, on spot grades here and there uh, in various locations. So we provided the drawings and provided additional grading detail. Uh, number two, relating to the preceding comment, uh, there was some specific locations where additional information for spot grades were required where, depending on how you looked at it, uh, uh, they were flat slopes and just wanted to make sure that we had positive pitch and we weren't creating puddles anywhere. Uh, we have uh, added more information to that effect on the plan, uh, but Matt um, identified a couple of areas in the courtyard in the courtyard area uh, which is this area here in between the buildings uh, where we have a, a series of sidewalks and benches uh, for folks. Uh, we've, we've left this area very uh, relatively flat uh, to make sure that we have uh, accessible routes uh, throughout the courtyard area. And um, uh, we just got the letter today. Matt's going to provide us with a little sketch of a couple of questions that he had uh, so that we can just add a couple more um, spot shots to make sure that we don't have any flat spots. Uh, does, that, does that pretty much cover it? Okay. That was item number two. Item number three uh, was another a minor grade adjustment on lot A, uh, which was a, uh, a, a line that was remaining from a previous uh, original plans. We, uh, we addressed that item, no further comments. I've got the bottom of page two now. Item number four has to do with the, um, the future parking area. And we had left uh, the uh, proposed uh, grading of that area uh, shown as if we were going to be building building the paved parking. So we revised the grading uh, to show what it's going to look like now, that it's going to just be uh, uh, vegetated. So no, no further comment there. That's the grading design section. On page three, at the very top, uh, utility services. Uh, there were four items uh, that talked about fire and domestic water service. Uh, there were uh, other comments about water service pipes and how the domestic services were going to come off of the proposed uh, water connections on the street. And then the last comment had to do with the hydrant location. I'll go there in a minute. Uh, what we did uh, is I uh, reached out to the town engineer um, who uh, also conferred with DBW when we reviewed each one of our utility connections. with what DPW and, and the Water Department uh, require for how we're going to connect each one of these units uh, to the water main and how we're going to run the fire suppression lines to those buildings that were, are going to require sprinkler systems and just to point them out. Uh, we have the two four-unit townhouse buildings. Uh, they're going to be sprinkled. Uh, there's a little fire access room uh, that the fire chief uh, wanted us to add to the plans. Uh, this allows the uh, fire department uh, access from an outside door into the sprinkler room. And then similarly, obviously uh, each one of these buildings, the 12 unit buildings and the, uh, the larger building here, building one, are also going to have uh, full sprinkler systems. Uh, those fire department connections um, are shown um, at locations that allow uh, the fire apparatus to have easy access. So if a fire truck came in this way, they would have direct access to this main entrance here. That's where the fire department connections are. Similarly, for this building over here, they are right here. And then for the large building, once again, if you come around this side, um, readily accessible at this location here, which is the main entrance to the building on this side of the building. Uh, the existing hydrant that's at the intersection of Eaton and Lakeview here, uh, the town engineer um, uh, asked us to replace that hydrant, it's a little bit older. Uh, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna just take off the old hydrant and, and uh, replace it with a new one. Uh, so there'll be a brand new hydrant at this location. Uh, in Chief Burns' letter, uh, there was a comment here about the hydrants, and since we're talking about hydrants, 
uh, chief asked uh, for a second hydrant location in mm -hmm. uh, the most recent one that we received today. Mm -hmm. and that hydrant uh, location is going to be uh, somewhere in the back of the project here. Uh, so uh, we're going to we're going to run uh, another water line, if you will, uh, to the back of the project, uh, and we will identify a location on this side or on this side and, and run it by uh, Chief Burns to make sure that he's happy with. Uh, that location uh, before we come and see you again. That was for utility services uh, un, uh, under water service. Number two, sanitary sewer service. Uh, you may recall that um, on our condominium uh, townhouse project, uh, this four unit building um, can't quite get to gravity uh, to our sewer extension. Uh, here's where the sewer ends, uh, just to refresh your memory on Lakeview Avenue. We're proposing a sewer extension that will run to here with uh, one, two, three manholes. And for this building, uh, we have proposed a, a sewer pump station that will have a small uh, pressure pipe that will pump the sewage up to the sewer manhole and into the new sewer pipe. Uh, we didn't design that pump station when we submitted that. Uh, we normally uh, don't do that until much later in the process, but, uh, but we went ahead and, um, and did a, you know, it's more than a preliminary design. Uh, our sheet, our last sheet in our uh, details set shows the well, uh, the wet well, if you will, uh, and shows the pumps that we're uh, thinking about using, a uh, dual grinder pump system, uh, and there are calculations that show that we're providing 24-hour emergency storage, uh, which is one of the two uh, things that you're supposed to do uh, either provide 24 hour storage or backup power in case of a power in case of power failure. Those details were added to the plan uh, and there were no further comment uh, after reviewing those details uh, from, uh, from Mitch Engineering. Uh, on the following page, which is page four at the top, uh, there was uh, a comment about uh, identifying the invert or the elevation of the pipe under the ground at the existing sewer manhole that we were going to be coming off of. That information is shown on our utility plan, uh, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't shown on the existing conditions plan, uh, and so that's why um, uh, Matt didn't see that the first time through. Uh, but we'll, we'll make sure to also add it to the existing conditions plan on, on, the, on the final plan. Uh, we had a leftover detail uh, for gas traffic, how long we had the parking garage. That's been eliminated, so no further comment on that. Number three on the top of page uh, four under utility discussion is electric service. Uh, and uh, we have shown uh, two proposed uh, transport pad locations, uh, one for the townhouse project uh, and one for uh, the apartment project on this side. Uh, no further comment uh, on that. Uh, the next section on page four, halfway down the stormwater management. And number one, I uh, called for uh, re, uh, reconnecting our roof drain so that uh, the roof drains were not running through a couple of uh, catch basins that we had uh, at various locations. And instead, just make sure that we were running them uh, through drain manholes, which we did. Uh, no further comment there. Uh, the next comment uh, had to do with the uh, with design, uh, specifically uh, Mitch Engineering asked us to explore the potential for increasing the overall closed piping system elevation to maximize its capacity for free discharge gravity pipe flow uh, consistent with standard engineering practice. So what we did is we went back to our design uh, and um, in the system uh, from our seventh uh, seven uh, trap oil separator units here uh, and here we, we went backwards and picked up the entire drainage system as much as we could uh, to maintain um, uh, additional or to provide for additional uh, free discharge in that system. Uh, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that. Uh, um, yeah, I guess I could real quick just explain what the comment was about. So, <coughs> So typically for a, a drainage system for a commercial project or a municipal project, is there, I'm, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the various design storm levels that are talked about in those systems, those two-year, 10-year, 25, and 100-year storm events, right? And is anybody unfamiliar with the, that jargon? So usually a, a system like this would be designed for to, to, to function under 25-year designs. It's kind of standard practice. and. Um, 
when we started looking at the hydraulics that were uh, information that was provided by the applicant, we noted that uh, due to some topographic constraints on the site, uh, during most of the storm events, the design storm events, <clears throat> those infiltration fields were basically going to fill up with water. And in addition to those filling up, uh, a good portion of the, of the connected piping system would uh, be full of water as well. So hydraulically, um, the applicant showed that the overall system would, would function. It would not surcharge the grade, um, which is fine. But one of the results of that, that condition can be, if it happens frequently enough, uh, lack of what's called self-cleaning velocity in the pipes. So water is not flowing through the pipes fast enough to move sediment or other debris into the water quality unit that's intended to catch all that stuff. Um, so uh, one way to remedy that, uh, even though the overall system will still function the same, is to, as Chris mentioned, lift the piping up so that for the majority of the pipes, there's water actively flowing through those toward the infiltration fields. Um, and, was, and the reason I'm explaining this is because um, the revised uh, system, the, the two and 10 year storm events, which there seems to, to still be some water or backwater into the system during the 25 year storm event. Um, however, for, because of the, the, the constraints on the project and um, uh, the fact that this is a, it's a private development, and it, technically the system still meets the, the associated with the EP um, performance standards overall. Uh, we didn't really think it was appropriate for us to object to the system as designed currently. And primarily because uh, from a realistic standpoint, um, when you talk about it, a 25-year uh, design storm, you're, I forget what the numbers are in this project, Chris, but you're talking about five, six inch rainfall, which is obviously quite a bit of rain. Um, the lower storm events, even the two-year storm event, is a little over three-inch rainfall, which I'm sure everyone can agree is still, you know, a major rainstorm. Everyone knows it's happening. Um, you look at the frequency of those storms uh, based on actual rainfall data. Um, not to throw up too much jargon out, but if you look at what we refer to as a 95th percentile storm event, meaning 95 out of 100 storm events in one year would fall under a certain rainfall depth. That's really, then you're talking around like a, like a 1.6 to 2-inch two, 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 two rainfall. So even the lower level storms events, or storm events are very rare, very, very rare. Um, and in this case, we thought it was appropriate for the system to remain as it is, because it they, they did maximize the, uh, the elevation of the pipeline. So sorry about the long-winded answer. I just wanted to make sure everyone knew why we weren't. Um, Continue to offer that as a design criteria. Matt, with the uh, increased um, acknowledgement of our changing ecosystem and uh, the latest publication, 95% in, in today's papers, 95% of the Arctic uh, mass has now disappeared. Um, that's water coming. Uh, Reading is not that much, I mean, Reading is not in the best situation for, the situa for uh, these storms. I mean, we've been hit by a number of these um, deluged of rain where, you, where we can get like one to two inches in 20 minutes and our systems can't handle this. Um, what's the projection of this down the road, um, not knowing, it depends on who you listen to, um, an individual who has all the power but none of the, none of the knowledge versus the person who has all the energy and, and, and knowledge but none of the power. Um, we're in for something down the road. Is something like this, that's being proposed here, is that going to safeguard the uh, individuals who are going to be living in that well, development? Uh, I guess one, one way that I could address that is you know, when we do these reviews, one of, the, one of the aspects of the system designs that we look at, that, uh, that's for stormwater for you know, other aspects of the site design as well, but stormwater in particular, one of the things we look at is what, you know, what happens if the system doesn't, doesn't work. 
in this case, just because of the way the site is configured kind of topographically, if that system were to fail or clog or some you know, catastrophic failure of the, its functionality, the site would basically just overflow, you know, away, basically away from the buildings and off-site. Off um, so I'm, I'm, that's probably not, not the best answer for that question, but in terms of like how would it function under uh, an extreme storm event? I mean, um, you know, 25 year storm at six inches of rain is, you know, pretty significant. Um, so I, I'm not, I'm not, I guess I'm not quite sure how you'd like me to answer that. In terms of no, I think, I think when you, of future, uh, <laughs> I think when you said that, really uh, that. If uh, we were to get um, some of that, uh, yeah. it's going to be flowing away from yeah. the building structures rather than towards them. If they, is if they, a, is if a if the design included what we would call an isolated low point in the system, which would mean that the system overflowed, it would flow into a building before it flowed offsite, we would take a closer look at, at the functionality of it in those terms. So that's not the case here. Okay. So we're on page four. At the bottom, the last uh, comment number three, uh, for some reason the proposed uh, watershed maps were not included in the materials that were uh, given to Matt, so we make sure that, that you had a uh, copy of those plans uh, for this uh, latest review. No further comment there. Uh, on page five at the top, the last item under the stormwater section uh, had to do with uh, the feasibility of adding low impact development techniques to the project, and we talked a little bit about this. And uh, we went back uh, to the drawing board and identified a couple of areas where we were able to add a couple of uh, small rain gardens to the project, uh, in particular in the courtyard area. And so the areas that we're talking about are in the courtyard. Oops. And there are two of them here and here. Again, not, uh, keeping everything in symmetry with one another. And these, um, these low lying areas are uh, designed um, uh, with DP's criteria for um, uh, rain garden plants. Uh, there is a remaining comment, however, uh, our typical detail shows um, a mixture of a couple of different plants and gives uh, the developer uh, some options. Uh, uh, but Matt wanted us to specifically uh, specify the plantings, uh, which we can do that as well. We'll, uh, we'll make sure to have the specific plantings that are going to be within these rain garden areas here and here uh, added to our landscaping plan, uh, which you've seen before. Uh, so when you see this landscaping plan again, these areas will, will actually have the specific plantings and the table will be updated here instead of leaving it general uh, uh, on our detail sheet. The next topic was the wetlands and floodplain. And uh, there was uh, one comment here uh, that um, uh, Matt wanted to review our floodplain storage calculations for a couple of the areas where there is some floodplain filling. Uh, this is a wetland resource area, something that the, the Conservation Commission will also be reviewing. Uh, we, uh, we took a look at the, the areas and uh, submitted calculations uh, to verify uh, our, uh, co our flood compensation areas, and there's no further comment there. Uh, the final uh, section in the uh, December 12th uh, niche letter had to do with uh, the niche engineering uh, review of landscape and lighting. And uh, we, did, uh, we did go through it uh, at the office. Uh, I, can, uh, I, can go, I can go through it, and uh, I guess we can stop and talk uh, because this is, the, this is the last sort of topic. So um, number one, was a discussion about our proposed our providing plantings that we were proposing as screening between our project and a, a residential abutter on a sink that we're proposing is is located uh, on the downhill side of uh, this proposed retaining wall here. This is the, the residence here that we're talking about. We left a strip of land on the downhill side of our retaining wall uh, so that we could provide uh, uh, plantings here. Uh, this uh, comment has, a, has two parts because there's also an existing tree uh, that exists about, about right here. And it's mostly on our side of the property line, but a portion of it goes on to the abutter. It's on the downhill side of the wall. Uh, we stay away from it. Uh, there's no reason for us uh, to take it down or remove it. 
uh, it's an existing tree. Uh, it does show on our existing conditions plan. So if I go back, uh, this is the tree that we're talking about here. And you can see uh, it's right on the property line here. So the question was, uh, will the proposed arborvitae plantings provide uh, the kind of screening Uh, will, will these proposed plantings here uh, provide the screening uh, that, uh, that's going to be sufficient to, uh, to screen the, the townhouse development, let's say, from, uh, from a single family home? And at planting, we're proposing um, uh, to plant those arborvitaes at uh, four to five foot in height and eight foot on center. And they're on the low side of the retaining wall. And if you recall, this retaining wall is being constructed uh, because the existing land slopes down um, a little bit too fast uh, for, the, for a driveway. And so we're filling the land here a little bit, building this retaining wall uh, so that the slope of this driveway is uh, less than what it is today. And so this is going to be sitting up a little bit higher uh, than the existing grade. Uh, but the plantings are on the downhill side, if you recall. Uh, and so they're, they follow the landscape. Uh, at planting at four to five feet high, um, they're not going to be above that retaining wall height uh, in, in, uh, in many cases, and it's going to take several years, you know, for those plantings to grow up and become a full, you know, full-blown screen. Uh, so there was a there was a question here. Uh, let's see, we suggest that although over a long period of time the shrubs may sufficiently increase in height, but as proposed, uh, they will not achieve the intended effect um, instantaneously, if you will. We recommend the applicant review this condition and suggest additional measures to provide a more effective screen in this area. So we're just seeing this uh, for the first time tonight. Uh, um, we haven't had a chance to talk about it as a team, so um, that's the first that's the first comment. The only thing that we can do to, to improve that obviously is to plant some arborvitae arborvitaes that are a little bit taller than the four or five feet high. Um, we just don't want to go. Uh, I want to go crazy with the, the height of some of these plants because they do grow um, each year. I, I didn't have a chance to look at, um, I believe the one that we're proposing is, uh, is a dark American green. I can, uh, I can get back to you with, uh, with some more information about how quickly uh, it grows each year, but uh, that's what we proposed. So that's something that we'll have to sort of wrap our heads around with. I don't know how the board feels about that, Mr. Chairman. I think. Uh you getting that information, working with your team, getting it back to staff. I think staff can uh, work with that. Uh, I'm certainly not an arborist. I don't think any of the board members are either. So, uh, I do see one item on Matt's uh, letter, um, and that was um, electric service. Do you want to go back to that? Um, only because we're covering everything that was in mass that you're answering questions on and this became electric service became an issue with one of our other 40 b's we don't want to go back there again so i i think that um you need to get that information to staff so that reading municipal light can address it before we get to, to putting any electricity in there so, uh, so we, we have not met with Red Municipal Light, uh, but we can certainly do that uh, before the next meeting uh, just to review uh, when we proposed uh, transform that. And then you, even if uh, Matt gets a hold of that and takes a peek at that, um, I don't know, would, would we need to have Matt review that or Red Municipal? The, the, only, the only reason we typically review something like that is to verify that the, the transform locations were not interfering with Another aspect of the site function, you know, something yeah. that was placed on top of the green. Yeah, or you know. Okay. Well, we we didn't cover that, so I just want to make sure we, yeah. we got that in. Well, the screening mm -hmm. it might need to be screened. Mm -hmm. The transformer. Mm -hmm. So we'll be sure to follow up with Brett and get some light for there. Uh, I'm sure they'll, uh, they'll be able to help us. Well, Gene, made a, Gene made a good comment. Gene, you want to? My, uh, my only question is wherever you decide to put it, it may require some screening. And that can be tricky because they have to access the unit. 
but then we're going to have some interest in having a way so that this unit doesn't, you know, sort of blends in with the site with some appropriate screening. So it's a little tricky. We'll talk to them about screening too and what they like to see and what they not like to see. Um, that's going to be kind of tricky, as you said. Yeah. Competing uh, interests. Okay. So back to the discussion of landscape and lighting. Um, uh, so I got some feedback already from our design team on the dark American green hobble body. Uh, so they uh, typically will grow as much as uh, 10 inches every year uh, to a maximum a height of 20 feet. Um, so it's close to a foot a year. Uh, it's obviously going to take them a while to get to 20 feet. Uh, but, but we'll go and take a closer look at that to see if we can do any better. Mr. Chair, if I could. Uh, it, I just had a question about whether or not there's another way of looking at the grading, the retaining wall. Instead of just saying, let's go with bigger trees, is there a different design concept for that area? So uh, we can go back and look at that, uh, but um, the reason why we need a retaining wall, as I mentioned, is to pick up that gray to make that driveway right. not as steep. And so uh, our driveway is, uh, is at this location. Uh, if you recall, we had, we had narrowed that driveway at one time, uh, and the fire chief asked us to to widen it again. Yeah. And so uh, we lost a little bit of green uh, there. So that's working against us. And so um, I guess the, the facts that we have to work with uh, at this particular location is that we don't have a lot of room between uh, this uh, this unit, the driveway, and the property line. We wanted to create enough space uh, to do some plantings. And, um, and so that's why we can't that configuration. But, uh, but while we're investigating you know, what we can do with those plantings, we can take another look at the grading to see if there's anything well, I'm saying bring up the grade where you're going to plant the arborvitaes. That, that way, if you bring that grade up, you, you don't have to be so concerned with going with, you know, such big trees. Maybe maybe that, by regrading it, you, you, you're you making up the difference. One of the things that, that we could look at uh, to, would be to move the retaining wall um, so that it was on the property line or very close to the property line. Uh, that's going to be a problem for that existing tree, uh, but it wouldn't create um, a landscape strip, if you will, on the high side of the wall. Uh, <clears throat> but it, we may have to uh, we may have a problem with that uh, with that tree. Now, if, uh, you know, we probably have to reach out to the abutter to see what he would prefer to see. You know, uh, if that tree were to come down, for example, and we were to show him that the wall could move to the property line. And that would allow us to plant the trees at a, at a higher elevation um, to provide that screen. Maybe it would be OK uh, to take the tree down. I don't know. But uh, we can look at that. Thank you. Uh, item number two, the existing conditions plan to get a tree in the northern uh, block a property line. That's the tree that we were just talking about. Uh, we don't need to take it down unless, unless something changes. Number three, the grounds include several areas designated for snow storage. Several of the currently designated storage areas are located on portions of the site that may drain directly toward the wetland resource area to the east. We recommend that snow storage areas should be limited to those areas of the site that drain toward the stormwater collection system. So as you know, uh, we don't have a lot of room on our site for snow storage, and so we try to pick it up everywhere where we could. Some of those areas are on sloping terrain that slopes away from the parking lot. And so, so if that snow melts, it would melt on the um, vegetated areas and just flow into the wetland without going through the, the treatment system. And so the request was uh, to remove and those landscape, uh, the uh, snow storage areas show on our landscaping plan.
anything up site, uh, but we can definitely remove those uh, snow storage areas uh, from the landscaping plan. Number four, we recommend that snow storage areas immediately adjacent to internal and external driveway intersections should be limited in height, such that sight lines of vehicles are not obstructed. Uh, so uh, we've already talked about that one in house. Uh, we're happy to add a note, uh, not only to the, uh, to the plan that shows the snow storage areas, but one of the other documents that we submitted to staff was a snow and ice removal plan. We'll be sure to include um, uh, that language and further in the, uh, in the snow and ice removal plan as well. Number five, the drawings include a flood electric plan. This is our flood electric plan. That indicates anticipated parking lot light pole illumination conditions for the site. The plan includes a note indicating that security lighting is to be determined. We recommend the applicant provide information related to the snow relative to what security lighting may be required for the project and whether it will affect the illumination condition as currently proposed. So that's a note um, that uh, we commonly use on commercial projects. In our list of notes, let's see if I can switch over to the plan yeah, right up here. So that's this note number one, security lighting to be determined. So on commercial parking lots, when we have our parking lot lighting, at a certain time, most of the lights get shut off. And uh, what ends up happening uh, as part of our security light to be determined is one or two of those lights might be left on uh, so that if someone was work, working light, they could get out to their to their car. Uh, that sort of thing doesn't really apply to this project, and so that note should not have, should not be on the plan. So I'm gonna I'm gonna strike that note. Uh, there'll be small lights, you know, at each of our accesses and egress doors. That's a building code requirement. Um, so, so that's um, that can be removed from the plan. So. The final comment in this new section uh, talked about um, providing alternatives to transit. The DRT meeting notes referenced above include comments related to transit alternative items, including provisions for electric vehicle charging, zip car, bicycle storage, and taxi pickup drop off. We recommend that the applicant comment on these items and whether they are intended uh, to be proposed for the project. Uh, now, the only item, uh, we haven't had a chance to talk about this as a team, but if, if I recall, we have uh, proposed bike storage. Uh, and uh, Stephen Griffin, our architect, is here tonight. Um, Stephen, where, where's our bike storage? Um, it's inside the building, right? We have both. Like, we have some outside, outside areas. It's actually on the same So along the walkways, if you find the two of the building. Uh, so I don't, I don't think, I don't think, have you shown those on the plan? No, we, have, we couldn't find them on the plan. Okay. So we, I don't think they're on our site plan. So uh, we should, we will show the outdoor bike storage areas. Uh, but other, other um, alternatives. I know we've talked about them, uh, but at this time we're not proposing, we're not proposing any electric charging station, a zip car, or a taxi pickup drop off. Um, it's not part of the plan at this point, but um, that's kind of where we stand on that. That's the last item in the, in the, uh, in the, common, the revised common letter from the engineer. So in summary, you know, we went through a lot of items. Um, you know, if you look at it uh, you know, globally, there, there are a lot of my, a few minor comments here and there. And, and the big one, I think, had to do with the local loading zone and, and the, <coughs> the driveway and, and safety that the fire chief was holding. <coughs> uh, most of these other items are, are, are minor. Um, and can be addressed pretty quickly on the site plan. Thank you. Mayor? I, I think Chris absolutely covered it. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's where I tried it a couple times where I thought there was some additional information needed, but I'm happy to, to address anything in further detail for the, for the board at your request. Well, I think the last meeting we also talked about uh, a second elevator. Um, in the uh, building three on lot B, uh, and it appeared that it, it might be on the uh, revised plans, architectural plan, uh, an indication of a second elevator in the uh, third building. Is that correct? Stephen Griffin, Stephen Griffin, architect. Uh, yeah, Curtis Deacon, Adam, Um So, yes, um, there 
there's a couple items that were addressed in the town, working with the town. Uh, one was to show uh, knock, knock boxes in, in the fire uh, suppression rooms, and also to uh, indicate a second elevator in the large uh, building. So, um, so for the elevator, so the original uh, the original elevator was. Uh, We had just originally shown one elevator right here, but now you can see the bank two elevators. So we addressed that. And while this plan is up, can you scroll up to the, the, the other plan? I'm sorry. The other one. Right. So here we, um, while we're at this building, uh, we indicate the fire suppression room is right here, off of basically where the fire uh, connection is. And the, um, the knock box is right outside the door so, uh, for access to the fire department. Fire Chiefs Slaughter 2, I think? Yeah, it was, it was shown on all the Chiefs, yeah. Okay. Nick? I have a quick question. Sure. Uh, the fire suppression rooms, particularly on the outside of those four units, are they heated? Yeah, so they'll be, so these, obviously in the larger buildings, there's heat yep. provided for those. Uh, in these smaller, in the smaller buildings, we have this, oops, uh, like this little, the little area right here. Uh, there'll be a little wall-mounted heater that will be electric, basically, okay. that keeps it to a certain level. And, and, you know, it's just above freezing type of heat. Like, it's not, you know, 90 degrees. Okay. Other questions from the board? Andrew? Closest to the Lakeview Apartments, so that would be uh, here. 
So we can uh, we can very easily add a, a stop sign here and then here for vehicles exiting, if you will, um, to let them, let them come to a full stop before entering the public way. In the next paragraph, there was a discussion uh, about the traffic traffic yeah. impacts. Sidewalk on. 
Uh, there is enough room to have a five foot sidewalk. Uh, what we're proposing to do is have, uh, have it be right, uh, right along, uh, right next to the, the curbing of the road, uh, which would allow us to have a small grass strip of uh, two feet on either side along those sections of Lakeview Avenue that uh, with the right of way that is only 35 feet wide. Across the portions that, that have more than 35 feet or in the 44 foot dimension, uh, we would just have a larger grass strip uh, on each side. Uh, so that's the proposal. Great. Thank you. Okay. Well, we're doing that with the police department, so why not, yeah. Sure, uh, so Chief Burns sent along a letter dated December 11th. Uh, and, uh, uh, he mentions that he reviewed the peer response letter that he submitted on December 3rd. And uh, he noted the documents are not complete construction documents, but they are considered conceptual. He reserves the right to comment, of course, on the final plan before you know, the building permit that you uh, sometime down the road. And there were um, a couple of sections to his letter. Uh, one had to do with water supply and uh, with emergency access. So under water supply, uh, the chief requested that we add an additional hydrant uh, at the rear of building three, which is uh, something that we talked about already, uh, which would service the buildings on, uh, on the apartment side. Uh, this requirement and location was discussed in August of 2018. Uh, when I went back and looked at my notes, um, I, uh, I didn't have it written down, and I forgot to add it to the plan, so I apologize. Uh, the chief picked up on it, and we'll be sure to add that hydrant uh, location at the back. The fire department connection uh, for building two is not indicated on the plans. The fire department connection should be located in the vicinity of the front door of the building uh, in lot A. Also, the location of the fire department connection to be indicated on uh, sheet plan 8 of 17. We can zoom back out of this plan real quick, Andrew. Uh, you may recall that um, our, where we show our fire department connections on the plan said it's on the utility plan because that's where the water pipes, but if the chief would like us to add it to this plan because it's a little bit cleaner, we are happy to do it. Um, so we'll, we'll add those fire department connections on our layout plan. It's less busy. Uh, this is the plan also that calls out uh, the width of our roadways. Um, so let's continue with the chief's letter here. Uh, the next section is emergency access. Uh, the widths of the roadways proposed in the development are not indicated on the supply plans. Um, I'm going to make sure that they're on maybe uh, one than one sheet. I, I know that they're on there uh, because we, we went back and reviewed them. Uh, but we'll make sure to add them. If they're not already on this plan, it seems like the chief zeroed in on this plan as an important one, so we'll be sure to add them to this plan. Lot A, uh, as depicted on sheet 8 of 17, which is the sheet that's up on the screen now, proposes a one-way access road off Eaton Street. Uh, the Massachusetts Comprehensive Fire Code 5.7 CMR 1, section 18.2.3.4.1.1 requires single lane fire department access for us to have a width not less than 20 feet. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm positive that we uh, comply with that. And then the fire department uh, requires two lane roads to be 24 feet in width, which uh, we, we changed for the fire chief after our last meeting uh, with him in August. Turning radius should also be included on in the plans. Uh, so we, we explained the turning radiuses that we provide uh, for the chief, and they were adequate, but um, they're not, I know that not, those are not labeled. We'll add those labels uh, to the curving so that you can see those turning radii. Roadways of less than 24 feet or less must be posted with no parking signs, and permission must be granted to the running police department to ticket vehicles and no parking areas. Uh, I don't know if we have any conditions uh, where we are going to have roadways of 20, 24 feet or less. Um, as I mentioned before, the improvements along Lakeview, I believe, are 26 feet of pavement, so that, uh, that may not be necessary. The size and placement of the loading zones in the areas indicated on sheet plant 8 of 17 presents an obstacle to emergency access. Uh, these are some of the excerpts I read earlier. Additionally, the Eaton Lakeview Department, uh, Eaton Lakeview Development Loading Zone, second page, the parking regulation stated that the 
in Section 1.5, Loading Zone Rules and Regulations. The Loading Zone will be used for overflow of visitor parking at the discretion of management. Parking in the proposed Loading Zone area is indicated has the potential to constrict the roadway. Consistent roadway width must be maintained around the proposed buildings. So we're going to make sure that we comply with that. We've talked about that already tonight. Sheet plans 10 and 11 of 17 indicate snow storage locations. Snow storage is not permitted to reduce roadway widths or block access to fire department connections. The snow and ice removal plan should also address clearing snow from fire department sprinkler connections. Uh, we'll be sure to update our, our snow plan to, uh, to reflect that. Parking on Lakeview Avenue and Eaton Street must also be addressed. These existing road Roadway widths are not sufficient for parking in front of the development proposed for lots A and B. These areas should be posted with no parking signs. And I mentioned that a little bit earlier tonight, and uh, you know we're happy to we're happy to do that uh, if it uh, satisfies uh, you know, the, the local requirement for, for uh, fire safety. Uh, that's the chief's letter. Um. You did have, um, which we had asked for too, uh, regulations that you would be imposing as um, in the apartment complex on uh, loading zone and parking regulations and um, uh, this comp compensatory flood floodplain storage volume calculations. You had that and then the ice and snow removal. And then the last section, um, we talked about the management aspects of it. And I think you had put in something on that also, uh, which... The maintenance schedule and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> having just received some of this, I, I don't think we've done Suggested all the either. So um, unless the board has, I mean, we've we've got <clears throat> substantial changes to make on the plans that you have proposed. But I'd like to um, see <clears throat> if if uh, I don't think we need to go through this at this point. Um, but I'd like to also get to give the opportunity to the uh, community who are here this evening to respond to what they've heard, other than, my God, what did they just tell me? How am I going to digest all this? But uh, I'll open it up to uh, the um, public section of the meeting at this point to see if there are any questions that you have for the developer. Um, or the engineer or the architect. I, I have a question on the plants. Uh, so on, when you have the water gardens, the Chris, you have this, can you put the water garden? The rain garden. Yeah, so what, what is this thing in the middle of this oval shape between the two buildings? Uh, this one, what, what's that? So that's a, that's a, that's one of our proposed uh, contour lines. It shows the, the site contractor how to shape the land. It's just it's just you know uh, a vegetated area. It just shows them how how the grading is supposed to work. Okay. I, I just thought it was something. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see uh, Matt uh, Matt Moore from our office is also a professional engineer who helped help me prepare the plans throughout the project here. Everything's very symmetrical. He's kind of an artist and very finicky about how he does things. If you notice the public plans, there's a lot of symmetry to the to the proposed grading and some balance. Um, so you can tell his plans when you look at them right away. Any other questions? David Cannon, 30 Beach Street. Um, just in regard to those no parking signs, it would probably be a good suggestion if you put it no parking either side of those roadways because as uh, we've experienced in the neighborhood, along the lake view apartments, occasionally people will park on the opposite side of the road from where the signs are posted. So I might want to make note of that. Tony Garazzo, 130 John Street. First, I'd like to make a comment about the Walker Brook, Walker Brook Drive corridor analysis. 
We haven't got to that point yet. Okay. So we'll, hold so on. we'll just hold off on that for okay. a second. Uh, then I do have a question about the parking spaces on lot A. The site plan says there are 19 garage spaces and five surface, but the architectural plans show only 12 garage spaces. I was wondering where the disconnect there is. First. So Andrew, is it okay if we zoom in to, uh, to log in uh, over here? Uh, so the plan, uh, the plan provides for uh, one car, uh, one car garages on the uh, on the townhouse projects, uh, but we have enough room to park uh, two vehicles uh, in the driveway in front of each unit. So. If we uh, kept the garage inside the garage space as one space, and then the other space that's not in front of the garage as the second space, that's that's where that um, that, where that might appear to be a discrepancy. Uh, but each of the units has um, uh, the ability to have uh, two uh, parking spaces, one inside and one outside, in front of each of the units. Um, and then, of course, we have our accessible uh, space here, and then uh, some additional guest parking spaces here. Wouldn't that be 24 spaces for garage and then five surface for total 29? I, I believe you were talking about using the combination of the two lots to get your minimum number of uh, parking spaces in, <coughs> at one time. Yeah, let me just go back. Uh, so the gentleman is uh, correct. We can update, um, we can refer to them as garage spaces, but technically there are only 12. 12 garage spaces. The total number of parking spaces on the lot A um, is that number, but um, we, can, we can change that, uh, that label so that it's, uh, it's just 12 garage spaces. Only one garage for each one of those, uh, each one of those units. Okay. Any other? Yes. So I'm Brad Rhodes from 94 Wood Street. Um, I have an issue I'd like to kind of from the dialogue and commence the thought process uh, about um, when this actually starts getting built, construction traffic, right, and how we kind of take care of that, ingress and egress from the site. Um, you know, so not so long ago, um, you know, Eaton Street was repaved by the town, right, and it's starting to show some wear and tear, right? and if there's a lot of extra construction traffic, that's going to break up very fast. Lakeview was going to get rebuilt at the end of the project and become a new street. And so um, does it make sense to kind of make sure that the construction traffic actually flows you know, along that place that's going to be you know, renewed as part of this process and not kind of further deteriorate the existing infrastructure and potentially you know, impose additional cost on the town? So just something to start you know, thinking about and you know, discussing. Yeah, we'll have a pre-construction meeting when we get to that point where they'll, and we'll go over the plan for construction um, and how that will work, but that's certainly a good note. And we'll be sure to talk about that when that happens. Thank you. OK. Hearing uh, no other questions on the section that we've already talked about um, on my agenda for this evening is um, we had talked before uh, with the applicant about the traffic aspect of it um, which has been addressed slightly by the police department in their letter um, we've talked about it beforehand um, I believe the applicant um, through its team has talked about um, the actual corridor is, is itself, which is the, uh, that he would be, or they would be willing to um, be involved in uh, some of the discussion on how the town was going to look at this corridor down the road and uh, contribution t towards that. We haven't gone any further than that, except to say that we have before us what we asked for, uh, and we have this evening um, 
a request uh, for a bid from uh, Green um, to look at the Walker's Book Drive comprehensive corridor analysis and conceptual redesign. Uh, we've drafted a scope and sequence for that for Green International, um, which we have in front of us this evening. I think you have it, Ted, and your team has it. Um, we're looking at that. We haven't resolved the issue of what we're going to do at the time that the occupancy permit is granted um, or people actually move in either to the condos and or to the apartments. But this is a longer range uh, because we know that we have issues because it's a major intersection within the town. So um, the other item, at least on my agenda for this evening, is to uh, review this uh, proposal uh, for the scope and sequence that was prepared by staff and uh, sent out to Green. I don't know if uh, you want to comment on that. Ted? Uh, I don't believe we're really prepared to do that because our traffic engineer is not able to be here. Okay. Uh, we are, of course, in favor of the, of the corridor study. In fact, we, we had suggested it, and as you indicated a few minutes ago, we had agreed to contribute a reasonable amount toward, toward that study. Uh, we've never defined exactly what that is. Uh, I have no problem listening to you folks this evening. But what I would like to do is have Kim here at whatever the next meeting is uh, to give whatever his input is uh, and to authorize the, uh, your engineer to talk with him in the meantime so that a presentation can be made similar to what we've done on, on uh, engineering so you can hear from uh, your traffic review Peer review engineer uh, and from Kim, uh, and then you can decide what you know, how you want the, the scope to be defined. And at some point, you know, we need to talk about the specifics of uh, what's a reasonable contribution. Well, uh, I think that the issue that uh, we have this evening is to start this. Excuse me. To start this project, at least the, uh, the the draft of the scope and sequence um, and what it entails um, that has been prepared by staff, uh, because we're talking, you know, well beyond the uh, time that you open up and have your occupancy permits and whatever and the town needs to address this. But we need to look at the cost factors involved in this so that you can react as the applicant and how much of a contribution you want to make to that or we would like you to make to that um, we ought to get a uh, an estimate from the engineer as to what he anticipates the cost of the particular study will be and well that's, that's what we first step Chris do you want to uh... um, the comment that I was going to make is that I think I appreciate the applicants um, the need for the applicant to have its its engineer review the scope and comment on the scope and get comments to the board about the scope. My only, I think, um, uh, the only w thing I'd add to Ted's comment is that I don't know that we need to have that as a back and forth dialogue with the applicant's engineer at the next session of the public hearing. I guess I'd suggest as an alternative that the applicant's engineer submit any comments, any of his comments on the scope in writing to the board so that he can have a conversation if need be with Green. Staff and I can work with Ted and their engineer and Green to try to come up with some um, a final version of the scope between now and the next hearing. I, I guess we, uh, probably worthwhile to hear from comments from the board on the scope tonight and then see if we can work with the applicant um, between now and the next hearing to come to some resolution on the scope itself and what the applicant's contribution might be between now so that when we reconvene next time, we can report back with hopefully a resolved solution as to what that might look like. That makes sense to me, Chris. Great. Okay. Well, uh, we all have a copy of that. Um, as I indicated, there's, there's two aspects of the, the traffic. One is at the time that uh, the occupancy permit is given out. That's one thing, which is, uh, in my mind, 
has to be addressed. The second is the longer range vision of it and how it's going to affect the town and where we stand. And that's basically what this scope and sequence does. So I'd ask the board members if you've had sufficient um, time to review this. I know we have a tremendous amount of stuff in front of us that we're looking at, and some of it we just got this evening, so it's kind of difficult. And while, go ahead. The comment I have is that it talks about doing traffic counts and analysis, okay? And, and I guess what, I, what I'm hearing is that uh, the numbers that exist in terms of traffic numbers that already exist in the database of the state and the town and so forth are inadequate uh, on which to draw <laughs> some conclusions. And the other concern I have is how long is this, this little study going to take? I mean, we're talking January, so right on the corner here. Well, that's, that's now, this is part of the second aspect of it, sign. Well, parts the first, of it are, okay. Well, it, it addresses more than just the intersection of uh, New Crossing and Walker's Brook mm -hmm. and Lakeview. Right. Um, and that, that is, is the major crux of the problem that we have with that intersection. And uh, that needs to be addressed. But it's not going to get addressed by the time this is built. No. Uh, the town, because the town, I think, has got some ideas of how they want to go out and pursue um, funding for projects like this also. So that there needs to be sufficient time to do this. Uh, all we're doing right now is looking at this particular scope and sequence to start us off. We need some direction from Green International. I think we've decided on Green International. Is that right, Jim? Um, I don't think we've, yeah, I think we're, we're going to hope to work with the same group, yep. Because we've, we've worked with them before. It seems to be a good relationship. Yep. Um, so we, we need something to start from. And that's all I, I would like to see if we can, if we the board can get together and uh, authorize uh, just getting a bid. Uh, the bid is based upon what we have on this paper. And I mean, there's, there's no fee in, in, uh, in acquiring the bid from Green International. If there's some suggestions that they make to us that we need to modify, they're going to do that. Um, the fee is not as speci data specific as we would like it to be in today's um, numbers. Uh, with, but I think this is some of the things that we we're going to get back from any scope and sequence that we put out there. Um, I guess I would I would like to see what comments that the rest of the board members have in getting this out there and um, getting it started. The actual traffic mitigation for the project, immediate mitigation for the project at the time of the occupancy permits. That's another issue that we need to talk about, and certainly your engineers, uh, Ted, and uh, peer review engineers need to be involved in that. Uh, that's going to come up. We also have to decide tonight when we can meet next uh, because we're running out of time. Um, I don't think we have anything left in December that we can utilize. We have other things going on. Um, other people <laughs> have projects <laughs> that they that they want to run by the board and get uh, permission to move forward on. Um, so we're looking at uh, the month of January right now, not to confuse things, but we're looking at the month of January um, right now. And uh, I think we just reserved the one date, which was the, not the, not the second, the, uh, was it the ninth? The 16th, 16th I'm sorry, the 16th for the regular meetings that we have scheduled. And then the other Wednesdays, um, we're going to make available, depending upon your availability, to drive this home. We would like, I think, the board would like to get, get this wrapped up uh, no later than the end of January so we can move on the uh, decision 
because that needs some time for uh, town council to move and, and get together and solidify before we actually take the vote. Uh, Chris, did I? I think that sounds uh, right to me. I think that sounds right. I guess the only other thing I'd suggest is that it, the board might want, it, it might be appropriate at this time to, although there's a, a, a number of issues remaining to be resolved, it might be appropriate at this time to have um, a draft decision start to be worked up um, that includes all the kinds of boilerplate conditions the ZBA usually applies to comprehensive permit projects, um, findings of fact that describe this project, um, probably worth in, in very short order getting a draft decision worked up and starting to circulate it. Uh, again, I just certainly don't mean to suggest that that kind of decision at this point would bind the board in any way, but it would be helpful to start framing um, the issues that remain to be resolved some of the issues that are probably already worked out um, and start talking about what that decision would look like. So I guess whatever the next, the only other suggestion I'd make is that whatever the next meeting date we choose is, we probably want to get a decision, uh, the first draft decision circulating well before then so the board can start looking at it. And the, so the applicant, if there's any conditions that the applicant, this is the, uh, probably the most important part, if there's any conditions in the decision that the applicant is going to object to, it's important that we know about those objections early um, yeah. so that we can work on them um, and try to resolve them. I don't, I don't think there's any question that we're looking at uh, moving forward on this project. Uh, it's just getting everything in its place and as Chris had mentioned, um, we need to get started on, on all of it. We're running out of daylight, and we need to get that done. So um, I'll take uh, input from the board. Um, I would like to get uh, a vote from the board on <coughs> the Walker's Book Drive Conference Corridor corridor analysis and conceptual redesign out to bid, if that's okay with the board. Uh, I, I don't think I have that? anything to add to it, John. I, I look to the staff and to, <coughs> obviously to Green, they're the professionals on this, and uh, they put this together. I, I would say it's fine with me. I, I don't okay. have anything to add to it, sir. Would that mean that you're making the motion to... I'll make a motion that we... Uh, uh, Except this draft draft prepared by uh, Green International, then to uh, we'll go ahead and uh, put it out for bid. Is that what you're looking for? That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Do we have a second? Second. Eric, second. Any discussion? Gene, Chris. Yeah. So we'll be looking for a quote from Green. Quote. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Can we also get a commitment as to quote and time to come? Well, I'm sure that that we're would be cool. Yeah. Well, we this this is. This this yeah, I think we're talking two separate things. Yeah, so this is this isn't yeah. going to be associated specifically with the project. With the project, this is going to be a corridor study of Walker's Book Drive, which includes a lot of the traffic that's there now. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Okay. okay. But what do we need out of this study to enable us? Yeah. To make a decision on the project. Anything? I think what, what I'd suggest is that we need to, um, the, the way I, I think of it is that we would include as a condition of, the com of a comprehensive permit, a condition requiring the applicant to uh, commit a certain amount of the funding to this study. And that remains uh, very much open to just negotiation with the applicant as to what that might be. But there would be a condition um, that, that, that they fund a certain percentage of that sure. study. In order to get to that point where we can actually draft that condition and pin them down to a certain amount, um, we need to know what the study's going to cost. So, and um, and the timing. Time, yes. Timing and cost. When it'll happen. Um, so we need to uh, put a finer point on what the study will look like in order to make sure that the decision reflects that it's going to happen, uh, when it's going to happen, and how much uh, the applicant is willing to contribute toward it. That's how I think of it. So that's all we're asking for now, a bid on it, not on the 
and inclusion in, of that into the uh, final decision. Funding. Well, we'll put a condition into the decision. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. As to what will be done vis a vis all of these intersections, mm -hmm. anything. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And until such time as that happens, the project moves forward. You said it does move forward. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you could be living a long time with the current traffic situation you're anticipating is going to come until mm -hmm. some action has taken place. Okay? There's going to be a period of time, and I would probably suggest to you it's probably going to be in not a short period of time. Right. So we're going to learn by experience what the problems there really are. No good solutions we see. The, uh, other that it, this, this project is not of February of 2019. A, a decision is signed and moved forward that uh, in, uh, by December of 2019, the project's up and running. That's not going to happen. At least I don't think it's going to happen that fast. Some of it is going to happen, but not all of it's going to happen. So the scope and sequence is going to address, as we move forward beyond that point, um, and that's what we're putting out the bid for right now. Well, I'm not opposing to putting it out. I'm just saying it's... Uh yeah. There will be some interesting times ahead. Some learning. Well, the town has some Real interesting learning. times ahead. Yeah. And behind. <laughs> you know, the other question I would think, I was thinking of, and I, I, I wasn't going to worry about it, but uh, is uh, why are we so concerned about uh, connectivity to Lake Lake Power? Why is that? Is that a desire? Is that a want? Or is it a need? Okay. That's... I can see connectivity in downtown. That, that would be nice. It would be nice, no, yeah. No it's, a, it's something you want. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Or else the downtown development can shop with market basket. Otherwise, they won't allow it. Yeah. That's not I'm just being a stick in the mud. That's all. Mm -hmm. I'm offered all of this thing. Okay. Any other questions from the board? No I, discussion? I, I, I just wonder why this board is, is given you know, the okay of this, we're making a motion. We don't typically do this for, you know, any studies in town or any anything that doesn't really concern the board. And this, this is really not anything to do with the particular project that we're discussing tonight, the 40 b It has to do with a coroner study that the project is part of, certainly. But... I think it, I think uh, it is part. Uh, this is a major um, addition to this intersection. Uh, the intersection is a bad intersection to begin with, uh, unless we take some steps. I should say the town takes steps to mitigate this somehow. Uh, we're going to be in trouble down the road uh, where this project is going I up. Agree, I think. I agree, John. Certainly, I agree with the whole study, the concept that we should be doing it. But what I'm saying is, typically, this board does not approve studies of traffic uh, solutions or something like that. That's not a free thing. But I mean, hey, if we, if we need a motion to go ahead and do it, I'm glad to make that motion. Okay. Well, again, it's only a bid and it's on scope and sequence. Yeah. That, that can be adjusted down That's the road fine. if we don't start on it now. The town feels comfortable us making a motion okay. and giving our nod of our head to it. That's fine. Okay. I think there is a motion and a second. Motion, motion, motion and a second. second. Okay. Are we ready for the vote then? All in favor? <clears throat> Five zero zero in four minutes. So we can go ahead and make the bid. Okay. Um, I personally didn't have on my agenda uh, this evening to move forward because we have so much that has to be done for our next meeting. So the other issue for me tonight is uh, to see if we can f uh, come to grips with a date for the next meeting. And certainly uh, if we want to meet, as I said, the earliest we could meet would be the 2nd of January, which is the, the, day, the day after the, the 1st. Uh, I don't know what your schedule is, uh, that the board is pretty much committed to, I think, um, 
those four, actually there's five Wednesdays in the month of January. So we're pretty much committed to going all out to get all of this done. So I, I guess I'd have to go back to uh, Ted and his team to see what the availability is. Uh, January 2nd would work for us. Uh, January 9th, uh, Chris, we have Wakefield that night. We have a 40B in Wakefield, and I'm having cataract surgery. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't be here, that's for sure. Okay. Uh, the 16th, is that an available? The 16th, we have regular applications mm -hmm. and appeal. Uh, I regular think that we'd be able to fit a 40 Okay. So we would have the last two Wednesdays in, right. in January. Just as a heads up, January 9th is also the conservation meeting here. And if I could jump in, the neighborhood has been clear that they prefer us not to run these meetings on the same nights. So we'd like to honor that request. So conservation and this board should be meeting on different nights. So January 9th is out anyhow. Yes. Right. Yeah, the 23rd is there also. Right, exactly. So. Can we set the 23rd? The 23rd wouldn't work either. Yeah, they meet the 9th and 23rd. So, so the next meeting after that would be the 30th. Well, it sounds like if you could meet on the 2nd, if we don't get something, we need to get what we discussed this evening down on the plans uh, that Chris uh, was discussing this evening and that Matt had brought up on questions. We need to get that stuff done. Um, and that so, can be done by the second. So that, that, that well, then maybe uh, the and other. And then we can have the discussion, further discussion on the car or Well, how about, uh, we, I don't know if we can get it done that soon, but we certainly can have the discussion on the um, Scope. Mit mit mitigation on, on the project itself. Okay. And if you can get your engineers and our peer engineer can address that on the second, that will be the other aspect of it. Gene? Um, I was going to suggest maybe looking at Thursdays mm -hmm. to add more dates mm -hmm. in January. Are we going to do anything at the intersection of Walkersville and Lakeview? That has not been determined yet. The scope is a larger area. The other issue is where do we stand? And we haven't come up with that. We, we're talking back and forth, and that's what we're trying to talk about now. Okay. The Thursdays are a lot better from a conflict's point of view with other hearings. Me too. Right, Chris? Um, yeah, except ten for some team. <laughs> well, you'd have to, the board would have to do a 16th and a 17th, because the 16th will be our regular scope of meetings. Well, we can, uh, we can get yeah. Why don't we try the second and the other meeting would be either the, the 10th or the 24th? Right. Okay. Say 110 works. 110 and 120. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 If we could choose the 10th, I have a potential conflict on the 2nd. If we could go to the 10th, that would be better for you. Better for me. Gene, you don't count. You've got to be at all, right? <laughs> <laughs> the expectation is very clear. <laughs> 
how about? So the second attempt is the 24th and the 30th. Okay, on the second. Yes. So the 10th would work for you? 10th would work for us. And it sounds like 10th would work for the board members? Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. And the 10th would work for Chris? Yep. <coughs> so no January 2nd. No. Yeah. Get rid of January 2nd. Yeah. And we'll go to the 10th. Yep. And then we'll leave open uh, the 24th and the 30th. Right. Yeah. If we have to. And then if for the 10th, we'll also start looking at the uh, draft decision that uh, you're going to be working up. We'll prepare a draft decision. Uh, I think we may already, staff has already done. Uh, staff some of that. Some, mm -hmm. a good, good, good degree of that. Um, and circulate that to the board in advance of that meeting. I guess I'd suggest that also, um, um, also the applicant's traffic engineer, we should ask, get comments on the scope in in writing um i think ideally not just in advance of the board the board's packet going out but maybe early so we can start talking about that amongst ourselves okay everybody seem to be okay with that okay um then the only other question i have is there any other business before the board this evening do we have any unanswered questions? No? no. We're set for the the 10th yeah. then, and we know what we're going to do so on we'll it. update on the engineering. We'll hear from Matt as well. Uh, talk about the corridor study. Uh, uh, hopefully the draft decision. The draft decision. The draft decision. Yep. And the, uh, the mitigation on the, the mitigation. on the uh, traffic right. for the project. Chair, can, can I make a comment on the <coughs> mitigation part? Yeah. Uh, Just really quick. Well, I want to just put it in everyone's head before we go for the next meeting before they think about it. That's all. Fine. One and yeah. only one. Don't do anything. Leave it as it is. We've heard that. Okay. Okay. Well, you seem to keep wanting to do more. And it's that's the that, That's a board decision. That's a, not a. That's. I'm making it right. Okay. So, hearing nothing before the board the rest of this evening, I'll take a motion for adjournment. So moved. Aye. Second. Second. Eric, all in favor? Five zero zero. We are adjourned.